This is Fred Beck from Fred Talks 19. Today, I'm very lucky to be joined by Daniel Matthews. So thank you very much for coming on, mate. It's good to see you. No worries. Thanks very much for having me. So how's your day been then, Dan? What have you been up to? Uh, well, it's International Week, uh, obviously, for, for football at the moment. So I cover a, a range of sports and International Week's always a bit less busy than the kind of normal schedule of the Premier League. So just been working on a few bits ahead of next week and the return of the Premier League so not been too bad how are you yeah all good a bit busy at college work that's about it really on the interest as well so how do you kind of decide uh, which sports do you decide to cover then uh well a lot of it's not necessarily decided by me a lot of it's decided by the editors what they want to cover um obviously you know I can put myself forward for certain events for certain sports so um this weekend i'm going to paris for example i thought it'd be good if we covered france versus new zealand rugby uh, but normally i'd be doing football that's kind of my day to day and i do a bit of boxing well i do do used to do loads of boxing do slightly less now because i still do football as well and then i'll chip in with cricket rugby kind of as and when depending on the calendar really oh okay okay that sounds Sounds quite good. And which sports do you prefer to cover then? <laughs> I think boxing is probably one of my favourite sports to cover. Obviously, uh, the whole kind of politics and stuff can be frustrating. But in terms of access for us journalists and the openness of fighters to, to tell their stories and, and also the, a lot of the stories that, um, that boxers have are, are so interesting and, and they're kind of the best stories to tell. Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, they're not sanitised and they rely on the media to build their fight. So they want to talk to you. They want to be open. They want to, you know, give you good stuff. Whereas too often in other sports, the more professional they get, the more kind of controlled they get. It actually gets quite difficult to get players who I'm sure have got really interesting things to say. You know, they don't want to, or they're not really, you know, supposed to really come out of their shell, which isn't the case in boxing at all. Okay, I can see what you mean. Kind of boxing, they want to sell tickets. They're kind of going to need their exposure. That's why interviews are quite... Quite good and quite useful at the same time but why is that do you think for, for, for all these footballs example why do you think it's hard to get media access in interviews with the football players i think football now has become so so big and it's everywhere um that football clubs are just much more careful about you know their public image and and what you know the, the, what their players and what their representatives say um and for, and for good reason because every 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 word that a, a top manager or a top player says is is absolutely you know scrutinised to the nth degree. You know, if Jose Mourinho does a press conference and says something mildly controversial, it becomes a huge story because people care so much about football and they care so much about what the big people in football say. So that has made clubs and players obviously more cautious about what they say because they don't want to get burnt. Obviously, in boxing and MMA, for example, it's obviously slightly different because those kind of rivalries or controversies can actually be beneficial to the fighters or beneficial to the sport if it builds interest and that kind of public image that they want to present football clubs of being you know respectable organizations that doesn't quite have the same weight in boxing because it's a sport that you know is built off controversy and built off kind of slightly wacky you know dodgy in inverted commas you know characters or slightly you know, crazy storylines. That's that's the lifeblood of the sport, really. So, um, yeah, I think there's it, it makes sense why football clubs wouldn't want necessarily their players to come out and, you know, say what they think about absolutely everything. But obviously, we would prefer it if they did. Oh, OK, that kind of makes sense then. I guess the boxers have always got quite good stories. I guess football players do, you just don't really, you don't really get a chance to hear them. And just one more thing on kind of the journalism point, obviously you're a sports writer, I've kind of got the option, I'm in, I'm in the second year of college, um, I've got the option of university or kind of going into the world of work. When someone's hiring kind of journalists or sports broadcasters, do they always look for that kind of degree on the CV? Um, the one thing I learned when I was in your position was that every person I asked about how they got into journalism and, and what, you know, what their advice would be, everyone had a different route and everyone had their own, you know, piece of advice that they thought was really, you know, really important. And they're all right no one's right no one's wrong there isn't really one route into journalism which is both like a blessing and a curse um because there isn't you know a set thing you have to do you know you have to do abc and then you'll get a job that just isn't how the, the industry works so 
that's good because it gives you a bit more freedom to you know maybe you if you took you know quote unquote the wrong choice at one point it doesn't rule you out getting a job further down the line um i think having a degree probably is um useful um i didn't do a degree in journalism i just did a degree in um politics history and french just in case i changed my mind i didn't want to be a journalist and then I, at the end of that i did a masters in journalism i think more and more um they do it probably does pay to have a degree i think historically lots of journalists started off on their local or regional newspapers and worked their way towards the national papers which was very common and it was much more of a a trade that you would kind of learn on the job i think now having a kind of formal journalism qualification whether that be an undergrad degree or you know a postgrad or whatever it is you know an nctga training you know that is becoming more and more valuable and and therefore i think you know it, uh, provided you want to and there's something you want to study i think you know i wouldn't i wouldn't rush into getting a job straight away build up your knowledge build up your kind of you know work experience while at university that, but there isn't one way of doing it so i'm not going to tell you what to do yeah i can, I can see a point there do you think any like any amount of work experience can count to the degree or do you think the degree will always be on top I mean, no, I mean, if you're going into a job interview at a newspaper, like the work experience you get will be far, far more interesting to them than... Oh, really? Wow. Well, so all these yeah. interviews, all these interviews will really kind of back me up in a way then? Oh, yeah, like, they're, they're, they were, in, you know, first and foremost, they, they're hiring a journalist. So if you've, if you've gone to university, you could have the best degree in the world. But if you've got no work experience, then, you know, you're going to struggle. Uh, that said... Uh, you know, if you've got a good degree and you've got, you know, you've shown a willingness to go out and get work experience, then, you know, you've got the best of both worlds. So, you know, a degree is is obviously useful. And if it's a journalism degree that gets you a journalism qualification, that is obviously useful. So I was talking when I said that work experience is way more important. I mean, if you're doing a non-journalism degree, if you're wanting to do a journalism degree, then obviously that is valuable for the job. You know, my my undergrad degree is of no, you know, no use really to what I do on a day-to-day basis. But for me, it was, you know, obviously helped me develop as a person. And, you know, I, I became out of it, you know, older and more qualified than I started. But when I go into, if I went to a job interview or when I got my job at the mail, they're more interested in, you know, the work experience placements I'd done, the work I'd done in, in journalism, even if it was just at uni or, uh, you know yeah I wrote a blog for example so that's what they're interested in rather than you know what modules I studied at university in history for example oh okay all right then and what's the kind of the difference between journalism and then video journalism I'm kind of guessing that journalism is a lot more writing and video journalism is a uh, you're doing kind of interviews and you're recording them yeah um I mean I think the lines are getting more and more and more blurred now because um because obviously the internet and all the big media organizations and even small media smaller media organizations are all kind of multimedia now there's you know if you look at boxing for example um you know places like the national newspapers will do writing which is obviously my bread and butter so yeah you go and see a fighter or a promoter whoever it is and you record the interview you go home write it up and you know it's a print article or, and it, it'll go online we would we sometimes do video as well we'll obviously get photos and then you know the youtube channels will be there at the press conferences they'll do their own interviews so yeah clearly it's a slightly different art i don't have to be in the in the piece if anything actually when you're writing you kind of take yourself out of the piece and it's all about the um, you know the person you're writing about clearly is it's impossible if you're doing a video interview for you not to be in the video really and therefore you know that's a skill that I I did learn a bit on my journalism qualification video and you know editing videos and stuff but it's not something I use regularly and not something I particularly would say I'm any good at um, I'm a writer um, but it definitely helps to be kind of um, competent across the board, you know, writing, knowing how to use video, knowing how to use social media, etc. Those those things are becoming more and more um, 
you know, the lines are becoming much more blurred, just being a writer, like they're few, that's becoming more and more rare. Now there's just more people who can do a bit of everything. Okay, yeah, I guess you should be, yeah, I guess you have to be kind of good at the video journalism stuff and the interviewing and then good at, good at the writing as well. Anyway, we should probably move on to the, on the boxing. That's my stuff as well, because I want to, I want to know a few things. Um, I, so I first kind of found out about you when you went on the Boxing Social Podcast with Rob Tebbett. What was that kind of experience like? Yeah, it was good. It was my first kind of experience of that, that kind of thing. I've done a bit of radio and a bit of, um, yeah, a bit of a bit of podcasting before, but not much. That was my first kind of you know live reaction show, and I really really enjoyed it. Obviously, Rob's a you know Rob he's a, he's a great host and great at what he does, and made it very easy for me. Um, but yeah, it was, no, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, sure, Rob. I, I interviewed Rob the other the other day a week ago. He's releasing t-shirts, which he's quite pleased about. Did you get a t-shirt if you went on the podcast? No, absolutely not. Uh, he did. He was trying to flog them while we were there, actually, and he was making us guess. The uh, he had one with all the famous. But he guessed, he guessed the shorts on the t-shirt. Yeah, we failed miserably as a collective, I have to say. But no, we didn't get any. We we got to drink from the boxing social uh, mugs, but we didn't get any. Uh, no, no merch, unfortunately. Well, when the merch gets released, I'm sure you need to get back on there, and you might get <laughs> a free t-shirt. So it's a big fight this weekend. Obviously, but we. I think it starts. The undercard will start about one a.m which isn't great over here in the UK. And then the main event will probably start around, around about 4 a.m. Crawford versus Sean Porter. I'm taking it you're not going to America to watch you are staying here. Uh, I wish. Yeah, no, I'll be here, unfortunately. Then what actually, I'll be in Paris, uh, so I don't know. It'll be even later because it'll be an hour ahead. Okay, that's pretty worse then. But what are, your, what are your overall thoughts on this kind of matchup? I think it's a really, really interesting fight. Um, obviously, Terence Crawford you know, is one of the best fighters in the world, but they obviously the frustration for us is that we don't see him enough and we we haven't seen him enough against, the, we would love to see him tested against. Um, I think Sean Porter is, isn't necessarily the fight we want to see. Obviously, Errol Spence is, is the one that would be, you know, the perfect matchup for the welterweight division. But I think Sean Porter is not, not a bad kind of uh, substitute, probably, you know, top, top two or three potential opponents at this point for Crawford and I think as a welterweight it's, it's, it's an amazing it's an amazing kind of test for him and I think it it, it could he's saying it's, it could be the night that he proves how good he is and I think I think he's probably right if and when he wins as as I think I I and I expect most people do um then I think he could potentially just yeah just underline his quality uh, in another weight division yeah, I'm sure. I mean, uh, both are coming off a year layout of the ring. Obviously, Crawford was in with Carl Brook last October, and then Sean Porter was against for Miller. And since uh, Spence beat Sean Porter by decision, even though it was quite close, do you think the Crawford needs to get a stoppage here to kind of make a statement? Uh, I mean, you look at the people who've beat Porter. Um, it's you know, it's no, it's no slouch. Is it? Is it you know, Spence, Brook, and Thurman. So I think just being Porter is a, is a statement in itself and I think the type of fighter Crawford is coming up from from 140 I think I don't think there's any guarantee it's a stoppage and I don't think he has to get a stoppage but he's a spiteful fighter who hits hard and um you know the type of fighter Porter is who you know bring it as every chance um that 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 could potentially play into Crawford hands if he if he if he is as good as we think he is is and he is he has shown himself to be I don't think he has to I'm sure I'm sure there'll be a small part of him that you know will want to make that statement and, and say to El Spence look what you did and then look what I did but I, I think first and foremost given the the, chat, the task at hand I think you know he just needs to get the win yeah as I'm sure I mean uh, I mean it'll be I think it'll be very interesting watching it but I don't take too much of time Dan we've got one more point I do want to touch on um there's Kid Galhad and Kike Martinez on the weekend I was watching up here on my laptop and Kidder, he's a ma- he was a massive favourite in that fight. You know, he was dominating, but then he had disbanded. What, 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 did you watch it live yourself? I didn't watch it live, but obviously I've watched it. I watched it since. I was actually, uh, I, was, I, was, I wasn't around on Saturday evening to watch it. Um, I mean, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. Um, as you say, Kid Galahad looked in control from the, from, you know, the first 30 seconds. You know, he just looked sharp. He looked like he was punching very spitefully he, was, he rocked Kiko, Kiko Martinez early in the first round 
and you know as as Eddie Hearn said afterwards he was getting stick for it being a match cup and, and that's exactly what it looked uh, mismatch sorry and that's exactly what it looked like for for the first four rounds um I think the, the biggest takeaway was you know just just how quickly he unraveled from that one shot and then obviously the second shot and I think Clearly, the weight, we don't know what's gone on behind closed doors. We don't know what, what went on in his camp, but clearly the weight looks like it's probably caught up with him. Because he didn't he didn't make weight first time around, this time around. And um, you know, that is an issue for fighters when they're struggling to make weight. You know, what 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 happens to their punch resistance? So I don't think I don't think necessarily there's anything hugely wrong with Kid Galahad as as Tony Bailey you said afterwards. It's not like he's become a bad fighter overnight, just you know that's that's just not how it works uh, but I do think probably his time at featherweight is probably over and that potentially was was one fight too many I don't think I don't think he needs the rematch I don't think he needs to prove he's necessarily better than Kiko Martinez it's it's an amazing story for him but for Kid Galahad I think he needs to worry about himself and I think that probably means moving up yeah I'm sure um I mean Kid um, Galahad just got caught in the day you can't go Something about getting wet, but it's just unfortunate. His first title offense in his hometown of Sheffield, and he did get caught. Do you know what? What do you think is going to happen to Kiko Martinez now? Since you know what's going to happen, or your thoughts, or what happened to Kiko Galahad? Do you think Kiko could put, get put in Josh Warrington? Yeah, I think. Well, in the re- Josh already beat him actually, didn't he, a, a while back? Yeah, I think with all respect to Kiko Martinez, and you know, clearly it's an amazing achievement at his age and and given what he's already done and given how much of an underdog he was coming into that fight, you know, he deserves the biggest paydays and the biggest fights. And I'm sure that's probably what he'll be looking for. Um, and that's, but I think the, the, the kind of contenders, quote unquote, at, at featherweight, yeah, someone like Josh Warrington, who's obviously looking to, to win back the world title, I think he'll be licking his lips at the prospect of of someone like Kiko Martinez, someone he's already beaten and someone who he'll he'll fancy to beat again. And I think he won't be the only one who'll see Kiko Martinez as potentially the champion to go at because he's probably, you know, no one's suggesting in the same way Kid Galahad is a bad fighter overnight. No one is probably suggesting that, you know, Kiko Martinez has suddenly become an absolute killer who's, you know, reborn at 35. You know, he, he's obviously a good fighter and he's not going to be an easy night's work for anyone. But um, I think someone like Josh Warrington will, yeah, will probably have their eye and be licking their lips at the prospect of them um, of trying, trying to make that fight. Yeah, certainly we will see the third-way division, especially in matching boxing, you've got Lee Wood and Michael Conlon fighting soon. But Dan, thanks so much for your time. I do... I do really appreciate it. So where can people find you on social media and right? Twitter? And if you've, got, if you've got anything else coming up, you want to shout out? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. God, it's embarrassing. I don't know my own Twitter handle. I think it's at underscore Dan Matthews underscore. Um, and anything interesting coming up, well, you'll have to uh, wait and see. I've got a few few bits and bobs in the pipeline. Um, nothing nothing major or nothing that um <laughs> nothing that i'll be telling you about now necessarily not that it's particularly high secret but nothing uh, nothing um nothing to shout about really so um no thanks very much for having me on it's great to great to talk to you yeah thanks for coming on i'll put your twitter in the description but until next time then down catch up soon then mate thank you